Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our church service today. It's so nice to see all your lovely, smiling, happy, beautiful faces. So thank you for coming today. It's so nice to have a full church again. A very welcome to all our regulars, but we also want to say very welcome to all our visitors. We have a saying in the congregation that as soon as you walk through those doors, we regard you as being part of the family. So welcome to our family and we hope that you enjoy your stay here with us until you become even more part of the family. Over the last couple of months, the stewardship committee and the session became quite concerned about our church building. Because our church building is right next to the main road, there's been all sorts of things happening around the building, vagrants sleeping on the premises and just weird things happening. And because we are stewards, we feel we need to do what we need to do to protect this church building. Because God gave it to us out of grace. And being a good steward means we look after what God has given us. So we've been talking about maybe putting up beams or putting up a fence around the church or just trying to make plans to secure the church because lots of the ladies feel quite vulnerable when they have to come to church on their own. And this week our fears were kind of um, given credit because we had a break in at the church. And one of the amber windows at the back over there was smashed and someone came in. So if you're sitting on that side, don't pull a crystal and take your shoes off. See, just keep your shoes on today for in case there are pieces of glass. So the person came in, nothing was stolen. They just enjoyed themselves to some sweets, which is fair enough. Um, but so the stewardship committee and the session, we realize we need to do something to protect the church, but we really don't know what to do. So multi will be coming in this week and we will be checking all the eyes and all of that type of thing. But if you have any ideas of how we can secure the church and make it a little bit safer, we'd like to urge you to please speak to any of the stewardship committee members because we look forward to hearing your ideas and maybe together if we put all our minds together we can come up with a solution that we can all live with and that's good for us all. Ndia nibulisa nonke ge gama lenkosi yetu uyezu Christu. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we start this worship service in praise, let us sing together Jubilate Deo. Jubilate, Jubilate 
Moses met God in the burning bush, he asked God a very important question. What is your name? And God's answer to Moses is our call to worship today from Exodus 3 verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you say to the Israelites. I am has sent me. The great I am, our God, our Lord, is here to invite us to come into his holy space, into his peace, to come and sit in the Lord's presence, to come and find rest, and to come and share with God what's going on in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our emotions. And so at the start of this service, let's have a moment of silence. A moment where we can approach God. A moment where we can just breathe in His presence. A moment where we can just experience God. So let's have a moment of silent and individual prayer. Lord God, Holy One of every age, King of kings, Lord of lords, the great I am. We enter your courts with praise today. Praise for all you are. Praise for all you do. Praise for all you mean to us. Lord, we praise you for the beautiful sun shining days this week. We praise you as our days slowly but surely begin to grow shorter and the morning and evenings are ever so slightly cooler. We praise you for your presence in our lives, your presence in our meetings, our Bible studies, our services, your presence in our quiet times of prayer and your presence right here in this space. We praise you for prayers answered, for provision granted, for promises kept, and for unconditional grace, love, and favor. But as we enter your nearer presence, Lord, we know that we often let you down. We often do not do as you ask. We don't let our light shine. We are not the salt of the earth. And so, Lord, we come to fall before the cross of Christ. Jesus, you know where this week our attitude, our actions, our thoughts, our wills, our wants, our beings did not reflect you, did not point people towards you, did not show your love. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for those selfish moments filled with greed and enlarged ego, Forgive us for those moments of anger, frustration, irritation and hatred that we took out on each other. Forgive us for those moments, Lord, where we gossiped and where we colored the truth into fit with our needs. Holy Spirit, as we fall before the Savior now, come and reveal to us where we transgressed as we come to seek confession for our sins in silent and individual prayer. Jesus, forgive us. If our confessions are acceptable in your sight and our repentance is real, then Lord, let your grace, your favor, your mercy, your love and your forgiveness flow over us and through us, cleansing us, pardoning us and renewing us. Lord, thank you. 
Thank you for the fact that we can just fall before you and be vulnerable. Fall before you and be honest. Fall before you and know that we will not be abandoned. We yearn for you. We seek you. We are here because we want to meet you. So Spirit, come and fall upon us. Come and move among us. Come and connect to us. Wrap us up in your arms and whisper into our ears the words that you know we need to hear. Open our hearts, our minds, our beings to your presence as we worship together, as we read your word and as we fellowship. In the name of the great I Am. Amen. In answer to the forgiveness that we've just received, we're going to stand and sing together a hymn of thanksgiving and praise. All people who on earth do dwell. So let us stand and sing together. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Serve Him with joyous praises. Tell, come now before Him and rejoice.
The lectionary reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 5 to 26. And here we read the following. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sigar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit. And in truth, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. And here ends our reading. May the Lord bless to us the understanding of his holy word. Hands up. How many of you have heard this reading read to us this morning? A fair amount, right? Hands up, how many of you have actually read this account before? You should all put your hands up because you've just heard it. I've just read it to you. You've just followed along with me. All right. So it's very interesting. We all know this reading well. Yet, this reading only appears in the Gospel of John, in no other Gospel. Now, we know the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, but nowhere are we actually told what her name is. What's more is this account is actually the longest conversation between Jesus and someone recorded in the Gospels. So these facts are very interesting. But now I'd like to know, hands up, how many of you have heard a sermon on this reading? A couple of you. Now tell me, what was that sermon about? Living water, says Pam. What about the living water, Pam? And what else, Pam? Is that it? That was it. Drink the living water. Here you go. That was the sermon. Okay, fair enough. 
Now today this reading wants to come and remind us of something and to try, us help, to try and help us to remember it for future. We are going to try and make it practical and visual so that somewhere, somewhere in our nugget it can get stuck. And so to help us today, we're going to use some roses. I was hoping for, oh, they're beautiful, but I didn't hear anything. Now, most of us probably love roses. Some of us probably don't. It's probably because you've got sinuses. But for the rest of us, we like roses. They are pretty. They're nice to have in our lounges. And they show us something of God's creation. It shows God as the powerful, yet also the one that's concerned about detail and that's delicate so that he could make every little petal. What though is the one thing about roses that we could probably do without? The thorns. How many of us have not been pricked by the thorns? And especially as we get older and our skins get thinner, these rose thorns can really cause some damage to our skins. So it's safe to say that most of us enjoy the pretty flower, but we're not so keen on the thorny thorns that we find on the stem. But in many ways, our lives are like a rose. They are filled with times when that's bad, when we go through sad times, when we go through difficult times, when we go through illnesses or treatments or bereavements or trauma. And we don't particularly like those times because they are the thorny moments in our lives. But when we go through the thorny times, we get to know God in a different way. And it's in our thorny moments where we experience God as a pillar of strength, as a comforter, as the one on whom we can rely on, as our rock, as the one beneath whose wings we can go and hide away. It's these thorny parts that somehow bring us closer to God. And they help us to appreciate those times when we've got the stunning flower to look at. Now the Samaritan woman that we meet at the well in our lectionary reading is a lady who's experienced quite a couple of thorns in her life. And in the conversation between Jesus and this woman, we get to know a little bit about her thorny past, but also about her thorny reality. So let's look at the thorns that this Samaritan woman had to face. And we begin with her past. Thorn one. She was an outcast. Why do we say she was an outcast? Because when we read verse 6, we read that Jesus went to the well in about the sixth hour, in other words, midday. In those days, the women were responsible to go and get the water from the well for the household. And they would often go early in the morning or late in the afternoon because it was cooler at that time. Also, they would go in a group because it was safer because the well was often outside the city walls. So the fact that this woman goes on her own in the hottest time of the day means that she did so deliberately. She didn't want to see anybody else. Probably because she was an outsider, an outcast, someone the others didn't want to mix with. She probably experienced being shunned, being gossiped about, being pushed away, being made fun of. And so to protect herself, she stopped to try to fit in. And she did her own thing. So she probably experienced a lot of loneliness. And she knew what it felt like to be excluded. Thorn 2. We find out 
that Jesus goes to tell her to fetch her husband. In verse 16 to 18. And then she replies, I have no husband. Jesus responds, you're right, you don't, because you've had five, and the man you're with now isn't your husband. Unfortunately, many preachers get stuck here, and they assume that this woman was a loose woman, or an easy woman, or a man-eater, or a gold digger, or a miserable little lady that just liked getting divorced. But in our reading, Jesus doesn't judge her, and so neither should we. What many biblical scholars think is that this woman was caught in a leave right marriage. Now, what is a leave right marriage? We read about that in Genesis 38. When a man married a woman and the husband passed away before the sons were born, then the one of the brothers needed to marry his sister in law until a male heir could be given. Why was this? Because we, as we know in the biblical times, it was a patriarchal society. And so, if women wanted to have any say, they needed a man. A husband, a father, or a son to protect them, provide for them, and be their voice in public. Having a man gave a woman security. Now, in the case of the Samaritan woman, it seemed that her first husband passed away before there could be a male heir, and so she married the brother. Then the brother passed away before she, there was a male heir, so she married the next brother. And so it went on and on and on until it was five brothers later. And then the sixth brother said, oh, oh, <laughs> not marrying this one. And he probably had good reason. Maybe she was barren, maybe he couldn't stand her, maybe he blamed her for her, his brother's death. We don't know. Whatever the reason is, she was now stuck in this leave right marriage. She was not permitted to get married to anybody else but the sixth brother. But she needed to be protected. She needed somebody to provide for her. She needed security. So she ends up with a man that she cannot marry. Just imagine some of these thorns. Just imagine this lady's story. She experienced so much loss. Five husbands died. Imagine that all she ever wanted to was, her, was to have a son. Didn't happen. Imagine you were cast out from the family that was supposed to take care of you. And then the gossip stories with all the tales added to them started making the rounds in the community and very quickly you were bullied, laughed at, excluded. How often was this poor Samaritan lady not disappointed by her fellow people? So it's almost like somebody giving her beautiful rose and then chopping off the head so that she's stuck with the thorns. However, these thorns aren't only in her past. She's got thorns in her present. Jesus was a Jewish male and he sits alone at a well. And so this woman comes already feeling a little bit uncomfortable because there's somebody at the well. Now he turns out to be a guy he turns out to be a Jew, and then he asks her for water. Now this was a huge no-no. Under no circumstances was it permitted for males to speak to women they didn't know in public. And what makes this even worse is the fact that Jesus is Jew, Jewish. As we know, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't necessarily like one another. And also, the Samaritans were seen as unclean by the Jews. So if Jesus took water from her, then he in turn would be unclean. So this situation makes absolutely no sense to the Samaritan woman. So no wonder that she probably in a very, very loud voice said, You are a Jewish male and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? 
and she would have said this very loudly for in case somebody was close enough to hear so that if something happened that wasn't supposed to happen the blame couldn't be placed with her. She couldn't afford another dark spot next to her name. Now we all know that the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. But what was the reason? After the exile, or when the exile occurred, lots of the Jews were taken away. But others remained. And those who remained married women and men from the other nations around them. So when the Jews came back from exile, they were disgusted in those who had remained behind that they intermarried. They saw these people who stayed behind as unclean. And so when Ezra and Nehemiah started to rebuild the temple and the city, the Jews who returned from exile didn't want those who remained behind and were unclean to help build the temple and the city. And so those who remained behind actually started to sabotage the building of the temple and the, and the town and, the, and Jerusalem. And this then very quickly escalated. And it led to a horrible and a terrible conflict between the two groups. So much so that they moved away from each other. They worshipped in separate places. They lived in separate areas. They hated each other so much that they wouldn't even travel through one another's territories. They would take the longer route, the more dangerous route rather than go through one another's territories. Yet they worshipped the same God, the God of Abram and Jacob. Now why does Jesus, knowing all of this, take the risk to speak to the Samaritan woman? He does this in order to become vulnerable before her. She is the one at the disadvantage here. Why? Because she's a woman she can't protect herself. She's the wrong gender. But also she's a Samaritan, not a Jew. So she's the wrong nation or the wrong culture. She immediately knows that Jesus is trying to become vulnerable before her. And what does she do about that? She immediately knows that when Jesus tells her about the living water, he might be a little bit different. Because living water had a play on it. It could refer to water that is flowing, in other words, water that is fresh, that you are able to drink. But it could also refer to eternal life. This woman immediately grasps what Jesus is trying to say to her. And then a discussion between the two happens. And in this discussion, Jesus gets quite personal. Now imagine you're meeting a stranger at the well and suddenly he asks you about stuff that's quite personal. Stuff that you don't want to discuss with other people. But Jesus does this because he's asking her to trust him with issues that she doesn't discuss with anybody else. And so this woman is now faced with a choice. Do I trust Jesus? Do I tell him about all my husbands? Or do I trust what's always happened to me? The fact that I've always been judged and excluded. She takes the leap against all odds and she starts talking to Jesus and then Jesus surprises her because he seems to understand. He doesn't shame her, he doesn't judge her, he doesn't reprimand her, he doesn't make his own conclusions about her and it is here where she realizes Jesus is different. 
And once she realizes that, she connects with them. She puts all her stuff on the table that bugged her. And one of these things that then bugged her is the, faith, faith, is the fact that the Samaritans and the Jew worship the same God, but in different places. Now it is said that when you argued with a rabbi, it was a sign of respect. It showed that you valued their perspective and you wanted to learn from them. And so this woman, by just beginning this theological discussion with Jesus, the Jewish male that made her feel so uncomfortable, shows that she respects him. Her opinion of him has changed. Now Jesus then answers her that the time is coming where God will be worshipped in spirit and in truth. He hints at the fact that worshipping God is much more about a relationship than about a religion. And then he drops the bomb on her when he says, I who speak to you am he, which is the wordplay on God's name that was our call to worship this morning. If we continue reading this letter, uh, this account, we read that the woman left her jug, went into this town, the town filled with all the people that hated her, rejected her, abandoned her, excluded her, didn't like her, hated her, and she goes to share with them her encounter at the well. And in doing this, she becomes the powerful saint that brings people to Christ. They come out, they meet Jesus, and they come to faith. And for a brief moment, we see reconciliation between the Jews and the Samaritans. Now what does this reading come to teach us in the time of Lent? Those of us who've decided to give something up for Lent, or we are doing something special for Lent. Now is the time we begin to struggle. Now is the time we realize how difficult it is to remain disciplined. How difficult it is to remain focused. And now we want to give up whatever it is we've given up for Lent. We want to give up because we realize I'm quite sinful. But in realizing how sinful we are, we also realize how great God's grace is. All of us, no matter who we are, no matter what we are, we are like this bunch of pretty roses. We are nothing special. We are not beautiful. We are just stems of thorns. Thorns that signify all the bumps and bruises that this life threw at us. Thorns that signify all our past hurts, all our issues, traumas, problems, challenges, diseases, illnesses, sadness, hurt, pain, suffering, evilness. But do you know what Jesus came to do with all these thorns? Metaphorically, he came. He took it, he bent it, and he included it onto the cross. Just like Jesus came to make himself vulnerable before the Samaritan woman, so Jesus comes to make him vulnerable before all of us. By coming to sit with us, looking us in the eyes, and saying, I see you. I see your thorns. I see your hurts. I see your pain. I see your illness. I see your suffering. I see you. I am here. When Jesus comes to say this to us this morning, we also realize that we are not here because of a religion today. We are here because we have a relationship with God. A relationship 
where we can come before God, sit in His presence, and share with Him our thorns, our lives, our suffering, our issues, our challenges, our heartache, our pain. Because the great I Am is here to take our pain, our suffering, our thorns upon Himself. So that we can once again know how special we are and how beautiful we are even if life has chopped us up a little bit. Jesus comes to pick us up. And he comes to say, I am the living water and I am here for you and I see you and I love you and come to me. May we all experience God's kindness, compassion and care in the thorny parts of our lives today. And may we realize that God's love God's grace, God's forgiveness flows through us. That we are the ones that go out and share God's living water with all. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we fall before your throne with all our thorns. Lord, you know what our thorns are. Those thorns of hurt and pain that we carry with us. Those thorns of feeling worthless and not good enough. Those thorns of being excluded and abandoned. Those thorns of trauma and violence. Those thorns of sickness. Those thorns of suffering, pain. Thorns that left us with scars. Emotional, physical, mental or spiritual. We bring these thorns to you. Because, Lord, we know that you understand. You know. You've experienced our thorns on your cross. And so you see us. Jesus, come and wrap us up in your arms of love. Bring healing to the places where we are bleeding. Bring compassion to the places where we are picking off scabs. Bring peace to those places panic attacks we still have when we experience past hurts. Bring kindness and compassion to those moments in which we face new thorns. Lord, we know that you are beside us. You know what suffering is. You died so that we may know love, inclusion, mercy, grace, and faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for your great goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for your care. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Today we pray for those who are struggling with thorns of illness, treatments and surgeries. Bring healing. Help with the management of side effects and pain. Help with those physio exercises and grant us strength for every day. We pray for those who are struggling with thorns of abandonment, worthlessness and feeling unlovable. Lord, bring healing. Help us to realize your great love for us and grant us the strength for every day. We pray for those who are struggling with thorns of regret, shame and what-if questions. Lord, bring healing, bring answers, bring forgiveness and strength for every new day. We pray for those who are battling with thorns of mourning and bereavement. Lord, bring healing, bring comfort, and grant us enough strength for every day. We pray for those who battle with thorns of pride, thorns of greed, thorns, thorns of inflated ego, thorns of corruption, thorns of temptation. Lord, help, have mercy, change, transform, and help us to be more like Christ. Lord, you are the great I Am. To you belong all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. 
for now and evermore. Thank you for your blessings, your acceptance, and your love. Amen. Let us stand and sing together and can it be.
Zerubbabalo, Lenkosi Yetu, U Yezu Christu, Utando Luca Tito, Ubudlelwana Lomoya Uyenkwele, Malube Nani Nunke, En nou mag die genade van Christus, die liefde van God, en die gemeenskap van die Heilige Geest, sal met elkeen van jylle wees en bly. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen. Be peace.